Hey everyone, Keith McGinnis here with KCDC Designs. Hey, the question is asked a lot. Can I pour a flood coat over my color coat without sanding first? Yes, you can, but there are precautions. I'm going to describe them here. Okay, so as a lot of people have talked about, there is an open window when you can apply a flood coat without having to sand the surface first. And that open window is when the epoxy is what we call blue tape tacky. In other words, if you put your finger on it, it's sticky, but you're not going to pull up any product. Blue tape tacky, right? So there is an important aspect to doing this. And I'm getting ready to apply this flood coat on this, during this, I guess, this open window. If I were to pour a mass of epoxy uh, out here in the center or anywhere across here, and I don't trowel it out right away because this epoxy is so fresh that just the weight of the resin that I pour on the surface will cause an outline that you'll be able to see even after you trowel out and complete your flood coat. So it's really important if you're going to pour a flood coat during this open window that you get the epoxy troweled out as soon as possible so it doesn't have a chance to sit there and that weight doesn't cause a ring which is actually like a depression uh, in the surface. So I have my trowel ready and I'm gonna pour my epoxy onto the surface. You know what I'm gonna do real quick, just in case. And I apologize, I've got a cricket in here somewhere driving me crazy. I'm just gonna give that a quick wipe down just for any dust that may have ended up on the surface. All right. Got my trowel in hand. I'm gonna get my epoxy poured out. And I'm gonna immediately start troweling. And then I'm also gonna use that epoxy as a lubricant with my trowel so I don't take a chance of scratching the surface. Again, because that epoxy is so fresh. And I'm just gonna to continue to work that getting it close to the edges. Then I will run the trowel, then I'll run it closer and allow that epoxy to flow down that edge. Now I've got a fairly aggressive rock edge here, so I wanna be sure and get enough to flow over. You know what, I could have added a little bit of, uh, I'm a little late now. My thought was I was gonna add a little bit of bronze, glitter to my flood coat but this is for a customer and the customer was here during the pour but we didn't discuss adding any bling to the flood coat so it's probably best that I didn't but it would look pretty cool and just as a side note if you do decide to add diamond dust or a glitter to your flood coat it will sink to the bottom of your flood coat so it will still remain uh, food grade safe if you do not apply the ultimate top coat on the top of that. There. Now I've got that on there. I don't have to worry about that epoxy leaving any impressions. I could chop this with a brush, but I prefer to use my hand to remove the trowel marks. And so that's what I'm doing now. And then I'm going to torch it out and really that's about all it is. Make sure I get all the bubbles. Another reason I don't like using a brush is I just don't want to take a chance of losing a bristle, bristle and then uh, not being able to see it and it being stuck in my flood coat. Temperature in my studio right now is 73 degrees. Humidity is right about 30%, so that's pretty ideal conditions for pouring epoxy, in my opinion. One of the things is always be aware of where your torch has been sitting and what is on the bottom of your torch. Anything that's loose can end up on the surface. So just give that a good wipe down. That way you don't have to worry about extra debris falling down on the surface. Now when I torch my flood coat, the most important part to me about torching my flood coat is make sure that I do not leave any areas untorched. That way I don't leave any micro bubbles that later on as the epoxy starts to set up and those bubbles are gonna eventually wanna to come to the surface and pop, um, it's possible that the epoxy has set up to a point to where it is no longer fluid and that's not going to close back up once the bubble pops. When that happens, that's why you end up with divots. So I like to torch two different directions.
You'll also notice I'm not torching straight up and down. I want that flame to cover as large of an area as possible. I normally do not torch my edges, but because of the aggressiveness of this rock edge, I want to make sure if there's any air bubbles that I have those popped. Okay, now I'm going to go over it a second time, opposite direction. But that's it for applying the flood coat. Again, most importantly is make sure you do not leave any areas untorched, meaning that you make sure that you have released all of the air from all of those little micro bubbles and you don't have any left. So let's do a recap. Everybody's open window is going to vary somewhat. Depending on your climate, your humidity, your temperature, just know that in order to create a chemical bond, um, the, your color coat needs to be at that blue tape tacky stage. If it's no longer there, wait 24 hours, lightly scuff, and then pour your flood coat. Also, remember when you pour out that mass of your flood coat on the surface, trowel that immediately so it doesn't leave an impression. When you torch, be sure all of the air bubbles have been popped to avoid divots later on. Also, avoid torching after 15 to 20 minutes to avoid waves. If you torch too late in the pour, um, what happens is you only heat up certain areas. Those areas become fluid, and then when it is fully dried, you will see waves. That's where those are caused from. So this was kind of a short tutorial on uh, when that open window is and some tips and tricks on pouring during that open window period. Uh, I hope you've learned something. Please leave me some messages or some notes in the comments. Please don't forget to subscribe for upcoming tutorials and videos. And once again, Keith McGinnis with KCDC Designs. Thanks, everyone, and we'll see you on the next video. Take care, y'all.